Hi, I'm Kotz, one of the pastors here. We are starting a new series today, and it's called Directions, because a lot of people have asked questions, like, I if, haven't been with us for much, uh, we, how, oh, it's been about nine months now, but we disaffiliated from our denomination, and the big question is, what's going on? Like, who are we? Where are we going? So we're going to be spending the next few weeks talking about that, but as usual, when I speak, um, I guess sometimes, or a lot of times, I'm not clear, or, or maybe it's just that you guys want to learn more, don't know. So we always have this, Q&R, question and response. So uh, throughout the series, if you have any questions, you can scan this QR code and you can ask your questions related to the sermon. And as always, we ask that it would be clear, concise, keep it to, you know, I don't want an essay, you know, I just want like one or two lines, okay? And question, uh, sometimes you guys think that making a statement is a question. No, a question is a question. There has to be a question mark at the end, okay? So um, I ask that it's clear, concise, and it's a question. Like the Q&R has to be a question. And we will be happy to respond to it. And the reason why it's not Q&A is because we don't have all the answers. We just respond. So, yeah. So this is going to be going on throughout the whole uh, series. If you have any questions, we would love to respond to it. So if you send in your questions, if you submit it, We'll try to respond to it the following Sunday, just so you know. Okay, so the big question is this. Who are we? We are Westlake Community Church. Who are we? Right? Some of you guys have been coming here for a very long time, and people ask you, like, why do you go to that church, Westlake? You know, and I don't know about you, but every time I say Westlake, you're like, hey, what, what church do you pastor? I'm like, oh, Westlake. They're like, oh, Westlake. I'm like, no, no, no. Westlake. Like, West Life. I guess... <laughs> West Light, yeah, but, but who are we? What makes West Light West Light? Right? And maybe you know why you go to West Light and why you love coming to West Light, but you just don't know the right word. Like, you can't put words on it. So, hopefully, this series will help you put words to things that you always felt, or, you know, maybe you have better words than we will have, but, uh, and we would love to hear those words. But the question is who are we? Now that we're disaffiliated, and the second part of this is where are we going? You know, like, before we were under the umbrella of a denomination, and they had a direction, and we would just fall in line with that direction, but now that we're no longer under that umbrella, where are we going? And, you know, people sometimes ask me, like, what is your, like, target audience? Like, target, like, mm, people? You know, <laughs> You're right? like, what programs do you offer? Like, uh, follow Jesus? Like, I don't know. Like, how do I answer that? So as we started talking about this in our team, our staff, and praying about it and meditating on this, we realized that there's no one simple answer. There's, it's, it's not that easy to describe. And so as we started talking about what makes Westlight Westlight and why, where are we going and why are we going that way or what makes us unique compared to other churches, we came up with seven answers. Yeah, and that's why we have a seven-part series. And we describe each of these... Yeah, what's up with the circles, with the arrows? Um, we, just, we realize that each of the things that we value at this church is described easily with arrows. So today, we're going to be looking at this one. There we go. This one, which is forward. What? Where are we going? Forward? <laughs> I hope we're going forward. Each of these things has like a very unique and very important message attached to it. For example, forward is talking about the promises of God. Backward is looking to our past. Um, so like scripture is something that's given to us from our past, right? Outward, outward, what do we do about the people around us? Inward, is there inner healing that needs to take place? Uh, I made up a word for the series. This one right here is called withward because everything has to have word word with it. So withward means like we journey together and what does that look like at Westlight? Upward is celebration and worship and prayer. What does that look like at Westlight? And downward is incarnational ministry, that Jesus came down to be with us, right? Like, he's not like, I'm up here, try to be like me. He's like, no, I'm coming down to be like you. What does that mean for us as a church? So we're going to be looking at all seven of these things today, focusing on the first one forward. So to begin, we're going to look at Exodus. And you're like, oh, Kotz is talking about Exodus. That's cool. Yeah, because, you know, Kotz always talks about Genesis. Huh, we're talking about Genesis today, too, so don't worry. Okay, so Exodus. Here's the concept of Exodus. We're going to start from chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, Moses is going into Egypt, and he's pulling these people who are slaves out of Egypt. And the question comes up, like, where are we going? Who are we? 
And so God speaks to Moses, and this is that scene that we're going to look at right now. God also said to Moses, Alan's like, not me. No, okay. I'll, I'll talk like this. So God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as, as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. If you don't understand what he's saying here is, Moses comes in the book of Exodus, and before him is the book of Genesis, right? And in the book of Genesis, there's these hero, like, faiths of hero, hero faiths like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And it's like, you heard of them, right? That you know that God, you know, I have shown up to them. Well, I'm showing up to you, but in a new way. Like, they knew me as God. I'm going to tell you what my name is. Like, we're going to have this intimate relationship, something that the people in the past have never experienced before. So Moses is like, okay, okay. Tell me more. Tell me more. This is what he says. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out uh, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Like, hey, this is what I'm about to do. So he's like, I just told you what I've been doing in the past. We're We're talking right now, so this is present. And now let me talk to you about what's going to happen. Okay, so he's talking about where we're going to go. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and a mighty acts of judgment. Like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you who are slaves and make you not slaves anymore. I'm going to take you out of the prison that you're in right now. Let's keep going. And I will, again, future tense, take you as my own people, and I will be your God saying, I'm going to be dedicated to you. I'm going to show you loyalty because I am yours and you will be mine. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Okay, so Moses is like, okay, so we're here right now. This is what you did in the past. This is where we're going in the future. And this is what, so God's painting for Moses what it's going to look like in the future for them. Let's keep going. He has more to say. I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Like, I'm going to take you to a place where we will call it the promised land. The word promised land never shows up in the Bible. That's something we call it. Okay, but he's like, there's this place that we're going to call the promised land. So you're going to have a place to live also. I'm not just taking you out and leaving you in the desert. There's a place for you to go, right? And I will give it to you as a possession. And you're going to, it's going to be your land. So he's painting this picture. Look forward into the future. This is what I have promised for you. So let's kind of recap what he said. He said that, hey, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to free you, slaves right now, no longer slaves later. I'm going to redeem you. Not only that, I'm going to adopt you as my own, right? And I'm going to be loyal to you. Yes, the creator of the universe is going to be loyal to a group of people. Like, wow, that's right. And I'm going to give you a new home, promised land. And I'm going to keep my promises, That's a pretty good deal. I think it is, right? So they leave Egypt. Here's a little diagram for you. And then they're going to work their way to the promised land. Now, everything from the book of Exodus all the way to the end of Deuteronomy, they're somewhere in the middle of this line, okay? And in the middle of this line, every once in a while, these people are wandering, and they're like, what is going on? Is God trying to kill us? Oh my goodness, why would God ask me to do this? This is so weird, right? Or like, you know what? I haven't heard from God in a while. I I hope everything's okay. And he says, anytime that happens, I want you to look forward to the promise I gave you and it'll all make sense. Why is God giving us so many rules to live by? I don't get it. You know what? God must be a party pooper, right? Like I was about to have fun, but there's these rules that says I can't do these things. So that must be it. It's like, no, no, no. Look to the future. Look to the promise I just gave you, and it all makes sense. I'm like, so you mean, oh, I get it, because you want us to become the people that is the light to the world. So I get it. Like, we're trying to follow these rules right now. So it's not to kill the joy that we're having right now. It's so that you can make us into more mature people, so that when we eventually get there, we could represent you to the world the way that you want us to be. Like, yeah, that's exactly. So wherever you are on this dotted line, if you feel lost, if you lose purpose, if you feel like God is against you, look to the promise I gave you and it'll all make sense. Now, in scholar circle, scholarship circles, there is a word for the goal. I don't know why we just don't use the word goal because that's like common English, but they call this telos, T-E-L-O-S, which means like the end goal, it's the aim. 
And any time we always feel like we're lost, we look forward into the future at the talos. Okay? And so whenever you find yourself in between these dots, you look to the future and you get a better idea of what you're supposed to do now or why these things are happening to you right now. Right? So if you're ever reading through the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you feel lost, just keep in mind that everything... Like everything God did in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was done in service to their telos. Are we clear so far? Okay. So that was the telos of the Israelites. That's their story. And you're like, that's great, Kotz. You know, the Israelites had a telos. That's cool. But I, I, do we have a telos? Well, what about, like, what is the telos for the rest of us? Like for the rest of humanity? What about us? We're not Israelites. Like, what's our telos? So, we're going to be talking about what our telos is today and how that helps us decide how we're supposed to live today as a church. But as I promised earlier, before we look to the future, we need to talk about Genesis. Yeah, because I love Genesis. Okay, so let's look at Genesis chapter 2. This is the creation story. We're talk- this is the part of the story where God creates the world and he puts people in it and then he's like i'm gonna create a garden right at the middle of it at the top of the mountain okay so that's this part right here now the lord god had planted a garden in the east in eden and there he put the man he had formed god is creating the world and he wants a relationship so he says i'm gonna create humanity in the garden where i'm dwelling there's this union with god let's keep going The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye. So like, ooh, beautiful tree, wonderful, right? And good for food, Mm, delicious food coming from the tree, awesome. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, tree of life, this is really important, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not a good tree. So we're just gonna focus on this today, the tree of life. As long as they were eating from this tree, they had life. It's the source of life, okay? And from that tree in the middle of the garden, next verse, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. So from the source of life, there is this river that's pouring out into, into, splits into four. And if you read on, we're not going to read it today, but if you read on, the rivers all went to major civilizations of the world. Some of them were eventually like even the enemies of God's people, but God was providing life to these people. Okay. And then we skip to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And to work it and to take care of it implies here that God is creating the world, but he doesn't want to hog all the joy. So he's like, I'm going to create humanity, and they are going to partner with me in managing the world, making the world a better place, creating more things. Like God created for seven days, and he's like, this is so cool. Now, come on, humanity, let's see you try Oh, whoa, that's cool. Like, he even says, you can even name the animals if you want. You know, like, you got a lot of creativity. Like, hippopotamus. Like, oh, good, 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 good name, Adam. Good job. You know, <laughs> creativity. Okay, so here's a summary of what we just read. I skipped a few verses because we're, we'd be here forever. So here is an image that I drew of um, the, the garden at the top right here, right? The land got created, and there's an Eden, and in the middle of the Eden, there's a garden, Okay. And it says that God wanted to be with people. So he created a person, right? Now, if you read on the Genesis 2 narrative, you'll discover that, that God saw humanity and said, it's not good for this guy to be alone. So, you know, because humanity is about relationship. So he creates another person, a companion, and we know her name is Eve. But he said, it's not paradise unless you have somebody to share with, right? So he... He, he creates them, and then the descriptions in the book of Exodus is that, that they were actually both naked. And the Hebrew idea, because this was written in, in ancient Hebrew literature, um, being naked means that they had no shame, that they were exposed to each other, they knew everything about each other, and they were okay with it. Nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of, no guilt, nothing, right? And so there's this authentic relationship. There's no secrets from each other. And they got along, there's harmony and there's peace. And what we just read right now is that there's also a tree in the middle, the tree of life. And as they kept on eating from it, they lived forever. And from the center of the the garden came a river that, that watered the whole earth, gave life to the people in the world, right? And then it also says that they were given authority over God's creation, over the animals. So we have animals here. 
and that they were co-laboring with God. This is meaningful labor. They were managing and caring for and helping men that, you know, like if an animal got hurt, the, the people were there to help the animal, help feed them if they couldn't find food. That's the story that starts the Bible. Now, this, the whole Bible was a movie. That's the opening scene. God created the world. People are in unity with God, right? And some of the descriptions of this is something that we should take note of here. Okay, so in the creation story, this is what we know so far. First thing we have to recognize is that there was union with God. People and God together. Another thing we learn is that there's a tree in there, which is the source of life. Like, oh, wow, there's everything we need is right here. Like, we have relationship with God. We have the source of life. We can live forever. And not only that, we don't want to hoard this life to ourselves. So there is also this river that gave life to the world. Right? This is like the perfect world. This is, this is paradise. And then what we also learn is that they weren't just sitting there doing nothing. They actually had meaningful labor. They were doing things that made the world a better place. And it made them feel full. Not that their identity came from their work, but as they were doing it, they were like, I can't believe I'm doing this with God. The creator, like, I get to be a part of this big thing that on my own, I could only do this. But as part of God's work, I'm actually accomplishing big things in this world. That's, wow, this is great, right? And then we also learn that there's authentic relationships. Nothing to hide. You could be yourself. And God says, that's good. You could be yourself and the people around you say, that's good. This is the beginning of the movie. This is the beginning of the story. Okay, so let's look at that diagram again. Of, so we start here. So we're not talking about the Israelites anymore. We're talking about our story now. Humanity starts here. And now there's the telos. What's our telos? Well, the best way to find out where the whole story ends is to go to the very end of the Bible. So if we were to just take out the whole issue of sin from the Bible, there's only four chapters. It's like a small pamphlet, right? Chapter 1, chapter 2, Genesis, and chapter 21 and chapter 22 of Revelation. So let's look at Revelation chapter 21 to see how the story ends. Okay, here we go. Are you guys following so far? Okay, because I'm talking really well. You guys are used to that. Okay. So in this story, we have John. He was one of the followers of Jesus, the youngest of the 12. And uh, he's the longest living disciple because everybody else was executed. He was just, you know, shipped off to an island in Patmos, and he had this vision. And in this vision, towards the end of that vision, he sees this angel. And the angel shows him how the story ends. And that's, he's writing, he wrote it down. This is what we're reading right now. So this angel that he just saw carried me away uh, in the spirit to a mountain, mountain, because, you know, mountains are important in God's story, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So imagine, you're like, okay, angel, you brought me to the mountain. What's up? He's like, yeah, look up. Like, oh my goodness, there's a city coming down, right? Like, oh my goodness. And it's like, I recognize that city. It's a holy city. It's, is that Jerusalem? Now, for John, who's a Jew, Jer- Jerusalem is like the city, like the, the highlight of all Jews back then, because there's something in the city that is very important to all Jews, which is the temple. The temple is there. What is a temple? A temple is a place where people and God could meet each other. Not only that, they also believe that the temple is the place where heaven and earth collided. So if you want to meet with God, if you want a healing, or if you want anything like that, you need to go there because that's where God's will and humans' will came together. So John is seeing this big city come from the sky. and like, oh boy, that's huge. And so as it comes down, he's like, okay, I know where I'm going first. I'm going to the temple. But look at the next verse. I did not see a temple in the city. So like, oh, there's nothing special about this city, right? But why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that's Jesus, are its temple. There's no more need for a temple because God and humanity are together now. At the end of the story, there's no need to go to a location in order to meet with God. You can meet with God wherever you are, so there's no more need. Like, oh, this is a really cool city. It's so different, right? And that big space that was taken up by the temple is like an open area. That's cool, right? Let's see more descriptions. Here we go. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of, what? The water of life. Where have we seen this before? As clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. 
So try to imagine what that looks like. You're like, hmm, we're on a mountain. Humanity and, and God are together. There's this river that's flowing out. What should I be looking for next? Oh, I know. Where's the tree? Next verse. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. There's, no, there's more than one now, apparently. Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So you're always living. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, what does that mean? Healing of the nations is basically this idea that humanity, as it started to spread over the earth, families became nations, and these nations started warring against each other. So the healing of the nation is basically his, his way of saying, and all of a sudden, humanity started to get along again. There is this restoring of broken relationships amongst humans. There's peace and there's harmony. And then he says, no longer will there be any curse because relationships are good now. The throne of God and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. This is his way of saying, everything I do, I'm doing it for God because I'm under his agenda now. Keep going. They will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. We're all getting tattoos on our foreheads. No, that's not. That's a Jewish way of saying when anything is written on your head, it means that in all the things that you think, it's their thoughts about what God wants, who God is. Um, There's other verses in the Bible about putting his name on your hands or your arm. That's their way of saying and everything that I do is for the Lord. So this is just Jewish language here. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 5. There will be no more night because night represented chaos. They will not need the light or a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. And this word for reign, some verse, some translations use the word subdue or have authority over same word that they use in the book of Genesis. When God said to Adam and Eve, you will have authority over all creation. That's his way of saying, you get to manage this creation with me. You get to be responsible. You get to care for this world with me. So, illustration, let's take a look at it. So, in this story, John is at the top of the mountain. He looks up, and he sees a big city coming from the sky. Boom. There it is. Jerusalem was pretty much square and had tall walls. So that's one. Okay. But we can't see anything, so let's kind of look through it. Next, there you go. Now we can see through it. Okay. Now, Jerusalem is known for its temple, right? So, you look inside, there's no temple. Why? Because God is dwelling there now with people. And what else do we know about this from what we just read? There's a river that comes out of there. And the source of life, oh yeah, yeah, they have actually trees on both sides, the tree of life on both sides. And it says that the leaves of these trees is the healing of the nations, meaning we have authentic unshameful relationship restored on this earth. And what else? Next, we have companionship because relationships are restored, right? And what do they do day and night? Well, it says they reign over or they have meaningful labor. So we have here, I mean, these animals, I don't know, if, yeah. I don't know if you're going to be dealing with animals, but whatever you feel God has called you to do on this earth, that when you're doing it, you're like, I feel like I'm living out my purpose. That is what you're going to be doing in this, at the end of the story. You're going to be actively participating with God, improving the world, cultivating the world, managing the world, stewarding the world. It's meaningful labor. So in the beginning of the story, we have creation where these things are there. And what we discover is that the telos, the same list is there. In other words, from beginning to the end, it ends, it bookends with the same thing. So, again, if this is a movie, you start off with paradise. At the end of the movie, you end with paradise. And actually, it's not really the end. It's like a new beginning, but still, we'll just say in the Bible. End of the Bible ends with paradise. And we, you and I, this church, we find ourselves somewhere in the middle. And whenever you feel like, what are we supposed to do? Where are we going? We look forward. We look at the telos and say, oh, that's where this is going. 
Now, maybe some of you have been in a situation as of late where only sadness has been your reality. You've been broken. You've been betrayed. You've been hurt. You felt like you're alone. According to what the scripture teaches us about this story, the greatest story, that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how the world was meant to be. You were meant to be people of the telos. You were meant to be people of paradise. This, the, the brokenness that you're experiencing right now is not how God intended this world to be. And if you ever feel like you're in that situation, he says, look to the promises I have for you. Look over there, and that will help you understand. Put everything into perspective so you know that what you're doing through right now is not God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life looks like that over there. And if you don't know where you're supposed to do with your life right now, look over there because that will give you cues and clues of what you're supposed to do right here, right, right now. And that's exactly the same question and the same struggle that the early church had. The first century church, the first generation of Christians, they were asking the same question. The question is, what do we do while we are in between paradises? What do we do? Like, are we just supposed to sit down and wait for somebody to, who could play the guitar to show up and, and we'll sing worship songs to God and pray? Is that what we're supposed to do? Are we supposed to just sit down and have Bible study until God shows up again? Like, what are we supposed to do? Okay, I get it, Cots. Like, everything was great, honky-dory. Everything's even better over there. But what about now? Because I think for a lot of versions of Christianity out there, it's, hey, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart? Because if you do, when you die, at the end of the story, everything's going to be great. But when you read the Bible, you discover that there's actually things that you're supposed to do right now. If you read all the teachings of Jesus, you'll discover... You'll, dis- you'll notice <clears throat> that Jesus seems to care a lot more of what we do right here, right now, than what's going to happen in the future. So what is it that we're supposed to do? And that's what the first century church talked about. What are we supposed to do? Right? I mean, Jesus was here with us. He lived with us. And then um, he died, and he rose again, and he left. Yeah. So what are we supposed to do? While we, uh, should we wait until Jesus comes back again? As a matter of fact, one of the first speeches, the first conversations that the church had, which is recorded for us, asked this question. What are we supposed to do until Jesus comes back? This is what, this is Acts chapter three, the story of the first church. He said, this is what they said. Heaven must receive Jesus, him, until time comes for God to restore everything. He's saying, yeah, Jesus is gone now, right? And he's been taken away, okay. But he's not going to come back until everything is fixed. Everything is back to the way it's supposed to be. The next time we see Jesus is when all of paradise is restored again. Right? And, you know, this is not something that the church came up with. He says, as this was promised long ago through the holy prophets. Like, if you read the Old Testament, that's where the prophets are. You could read them. Right? They talked about a day when the Messiah will come back, Jesus will come back, and it's around the time when everything gets restored back to the way it was supposed to be. And these, these, these early Christians were like, well, you know, when Jesus was here with us, he would show us glimpses of what the future will look like. Because in the future, there's no more illness, there's no more hurt, there's no more dementia, there's no more, right? And there's no more blindness. Everybody's able to walk. And when Jesus was here, he allowed people to stand and start walking. He allowed pe- blind people to see again. In the future, there's no more people who are outcasts. And what did Jesus do here? He started bringing people into the fold of a community. He said, Jesus, when Jesus was here, he was giving us glimpses of the future, glimpses of this new creation, glimpses of heaven, right here, right now. So maybe, the first century church said, maybe... We're not just supposed to sit around waiting for that to show up. Maybe we're supposed to start making that happen here right now. If we see somebody that's outcast, maybe our job is to bring that person into the church and let them know they have a family here. Maybe if somebody is hurt, maybe our job is to go out there and mend those broken relationships, broken hearts, and bring more heaven into that person's life right here, right now. But then there's another group of people who said, no, 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 no. Don't you realize that we are the problem? Like, God had paradise in the beginning of this story, and who ruined it? 
people. We did, right? So what makes you think that we're the ones that's supposed to fix it? Like, we're just going to make things worse, right? Like, look, we, we killed the Messiah. <laughs> like, something good shows up, and this is why we can't have nice things. Every time something good happens, we destroy it, right? So there's another group of people who started saying, well, maybe it's not us that's supposed to fix this world. We all agree that Jesus is going to come back when everything's fixed. So, but maybe we're not the ones that's supposed to fix it. Maybe at the end of the story, God is the one that's going to fix everything. He's just going to snap his fingers, everything's fixed, and then Jesus comes back. Like, maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe we have no role in fixing this earth. And that was one of the early discussions, debates that they had. Who is the one that's responsible for fixing this world? And so Paul, who is one of the first Christian leaders who wrote a lot of letters that made the New Testament, he addresses one of those churches who was having this discussion. And this is in the closing chapters of 1 Corinthians. This is what he says. Therefore, my brothers, my my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. And what he means by that is, the context of this is, we're trying to do good works right now. We're trying to make things better. He says, don't give up on that. Keep doing that. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. You are participating with what God is trying to do. You're trying to fix this world. Keep doing that because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The context here is really interesting, guys. When he says it's not in vain, it's because there's that debate about, well, are we going to be doing something right now, like fixing the world, and then eventually God shows up and just wipes everything away and then brings a new world? Is that what's going to happen? And Paul says, oh, I mean, like the logic behind that is if we're like fixing the world for God and then God shows up at the end of the story and just wipes everything out and says, here's the new world, like, is our work in vain? Are we really contributing to the work of God if God's going to wipe everything away and fix it himself anyways? And he says, no, it's not in vain. Everything you do right now for the Lord actually matters. How you live your life here matters. The sacrifices you made for your friends and family matter. It's not going to be wiped away at the end. Scholar N.T. Wright, and if you've been here for a while, you know I love this guy. This is what he says about this verse. You are not oiling the wheels of a machine that is about to roll over a cliff. Right? You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown in, uh, onto the fire. Like, what you're doing is not in vain. Like, God isn't going to just wipe away something after you work really hard at it. Let's keep going. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard as to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become in due course part of God's new world. It's going to be part of what God is going to create at the end. He's going to use some of the things you've done here, and it becomes a part of the big masterpiece. So he's like, it's not in vain. And he gives some examples. He says, every act of love, gratitude, kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nature, of comfort and support for one's fellow human, one's fellow human beings, and for that matter, uh, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer, everything that you're doing for the Lord, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. You giving up, sacrificing a lot of your life, things that you could be doing, but you're like, no, I'm going to give that up because somebody needs me. That won't go unnoticed. The hours and hours you prayed for somebody somebody's illness, you prayed. I'm like, please, Lord, heal that person, heal that person, and it never gets healed. It doesn't go unnoticed. Everything that you're doing right now will eventually be a part of God's big masterpiece. Wright goes on to talk about, he gives like this cool illustration, which I'm not going to do it justice, but he says that, you know, he was a, a bishop of Durham, and in that area, there's a huge cathedral, and he said, you know, I know people, and like people's fathers and grandfathers, who actually built this cathedral, but the great architect showed up and, and had the blueprint, had the vision in his mind, and he said, okay, this is how we're going to do this. There's going to be like a statue of a gargoyle there, and there's going to be uh, stained glass windows there, and there's going to be um, statues of saints over there, right? But he, the architect doesn't know how to do this, right? So he hires 
stone workers, stonemasons from the town, and they don't know what the final product is going to look like, but they give everybody a task. You're going to work on this. Here are the dimensions. This is the, uh, the, the stone you're supposed to use. And uh, I'll come and check on you in a few minutes. I want you to work on this. You're going to work on the windows. I want it to be this color, this color, this color. And when the light shines, I want it to have this kind of color coming through. He'll give everybody instructions. And everybody has an idea of what they're working on, but they don't know how everything's going to come together. They don't even know what the final product is going to look like. And so he said, it's kind of like us. We're working really hard at the thing that God has called us to do. We have some faint idea of what your other friends are doing, but you don't really know how it's all going to come together. And one day when everything, you submit your work and everything comes together, you walk into the cathedral and you look and say, whoa, look at this place. This is amazing. There's no way that one person could have done this. This is an effort of everybody. And as you walk in, you look at like, it's like, George, did you do that stained glass window? That, that looks amazing. He's like, yeah, I didn't know that was going to come here, but it works well with, hey, did you do that? You're like, Joe, did you do that? It's like, yeah, I did that. Like, oh, you're, you're looking around and you're like, wow, I didn't know. And then one day you're bringing your kids in. It's like, daddy, daddy, is that the stone you worked on? It's like, why, yes, it is. That is, yeah, a little initial there. That's mine. Yeah, right there, you know, and right. You don't know how it's all going to come together. But the vision that the early church had of how our good works today contributes to the great tell us at the end is that it's like God is working, we're working. We don't really know how it's going to work, but God already knows, right? And he takes all of that and he creates this new creation and we get to be a part of it. Left on our own, it's like this good work, yeah, it did good for a few minutes. But in God's hands, in the bigger picture at the end, you realize it's even bigger than you ever imagined it to be. The tell us will be built upon what we are doing now and what God will continue to do. It's this beautiful partnership. It's meaningful labor. So when we as a church don't know what to do, we look forward. We look at what God has in store for the future, and that gives us an insight, an idea, maybe some general idea of what we should be doing right now. You know, years ago, uh, when Lori and I were like, like, hey, you know, we're the pastors of this church. What, what's, what direction are we going to go? And we had like a board, and we talked to the board, and we prayed about it. We fasted, and we went, to, and we did our own little retreat and talk about like, how do we describe what this church is about? And it has to be catchy. You know, it has to be catchy. It can't be like twenty words long. Which actually, the first version of this was like twenty words long, and nobody could memorize it. And we said, well, how about, how about experience heaven together? And I'm like, that's good. But Lori's like, no, wait. It can't be experience heaven together. No. Because there's, there has to be something in there that talks about how it's important today to do the thing that God wants us to do for the future. Right? What, so how do, we, how do we do that? And they're like, well, what if we just change the word experience to <laughs> experiencing, right? Experiencing heaven together. Like, that's, like our, that's our motto now, right? That's our vision statement. Because what we do right now matters for the long term. So the question, who are we and where are we going? The first of the seven is we're going to go forward. We're going to look to the future. And that's going to give us an idea of what we're supposed to do today. This is a quick line that I crafted. I don't know how good it is, but Westlight looks to the promised new world and find ways to contribute to it today. That's who we are. We are a church that looks to the future, and we find creative ways to contribute to what God is doing right now and what he'll be doing in the future. Amen? Okay, so that's the first of the seven. Next week, we're going to be talking about backwards. Backwards, looking to our past, which includes the Bible. So I hope you don't miss that. All right, let's pray.